Hello, my name is Gordy Holt, and this is Community Talk. Each of us has stories, stories that, that help us to understand and to explain our world. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people, people who have had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who have had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories that help us to better understand our world. And they help us to connect with each other. And Community Connections is about those people and about their stories. And I'm sure that you will enjoy meeting these amazing, amazing people as much as I have. Thank you, enjoy. Welcome to Community Connections. My name is Gordy Hoag. And today's guest is a man who is an edu educator who's had a profound positive impact on many, many young people over the years, both in sport and in education. He has believed that you could change the culture of a school by s focusing on sport and the impact that sport could have. And he did that in many different schools through the course of uh, his career in education. He has supported, inspired, respected, and worked with many young people and helped them to become better, realize some of the, their potential. In fact, I was one of those students that he did that with. And I'm so delighted to welcome to Community Connections, Ed Carlin. Welcome, Ed. Well, thank you very much, Gordon Hogue, class of 64. Exactly, 1964, <laughs> Sammy High School. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and how you yeah. born and how you ended up in education? Well, uh, I was born in Saskatchewan in 1935, which was not a good year. My dad was plowing rocks in the southern part of Saskatchewan, and so the, the family decided late to get out of uh, the prairies. I mean, the smart ones got out in '31, so by the time we came to the coast. The people in the Fraser Valley had, had enough of these prairie chickens, <laughs> but we ended up uh, on relief, it's called in those days, which meant that the local uh, municipality had to provide you with uh, flour and sugar and things like that. Uh, there was no federal program for, for the people that were being displaced at all. And we moved to Sumas Prairie, and uh, the five of us, at the time, there were four of us, and then two years later, my younger brother was born. So there were five kids and two adults, and we roamed around there for a while, uh, moved into Abbotsford where things got a little better, then went to Wanick, BC, which is between Haney and Mission, and it's just actually what it was, was a mill. It was called P. Bain Lumber. My dad had a job there working on uh, booms, putting booms up, uh, up so they could get them up and saw them up the logs and his and his only skill was that he couldn't swim which seemed to be quite uh, at least you had to have two guys together one uh, pulling the other one out of the water with those hooks because they fell in a lot from there i went to grade three in wanick then we moved to mission city the home of the big red strawberry up the road eight miles and had a little farm and that was wonderful for till I was grade six. And then we moved to the flats, on the, uh, which is the, the poorest part of town. Lived there for another three or four years. Then I moved to Abbotsford, went to school in Abbotsford. Um, met a couple of teachers in my lifetime that made a big difference in my life. And so uh, I ended out jamming things as always. I was always behind. Uh, I had to do, because I wasn't doing that well in school because I'd been moving quite a bit. I'd gone from mission to being a housekeeper for a couple in Whitehorse to Abbotsford. And there I, uh, I had a, it was a really good school, I, I thought. Uh, and I had a good time there and, and I graduated. And then I wired houses for a year. 
Well, just and, when you were in high school there, weren't you, weren't you a bit of a basketball player and a volleyball player and a soccer player? And Well, the, the, the school, first of all, was heated. This attic we lived in wasn't. <laughs> and you couldn't get to school uh, fast enough. And there's hot water there. And uh, God, gyms were my life. Yeah. And if you uh, help the janitor clean a couple of rooms early in the morning, you get a gym early. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, yeah, sports were very important. Very, very important. And uh, then I met a old vice principal of mine in a, in, when I was wearing houses. And he said, you come on and see me on the weekend. And I did. And he gave me a piece of paper. And he said, look, you can be a teacher in two years. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, you can finish what you need in high school, the academic program. You can take three grade 13 subjects at the same time. And you can go into what's called uh, emergency teachers training program. They were so short of teachers, it would take almost anybody. And I did that and I passed all the courses and I ended out uh, way over my head uh, at Semiamu Senior High because what I was really, I had what basically was two years of university and uh, I was eligible for elementary school. And I jammed a job as a phys ed teacher at Semiamu. And uh, that was 1957. And uh, it was a, a, a very interesting time in one's life. You look at it. I was 22. The oldest kids in the school were 18. Maybe a couple were 19 in grade 13. And it had grade 13. And uh, people today wouldn't know what that was. That was first year university that you could take in high school. Uh, on your way to university. And only some high schools had it. semi Ammo had that. And so I was in a school that went from grade nine, very few grade nines, uh, two classes of grade nines up to grade 13. It had 402, I count them up, it had 400 and how many school, kids in the school? 405 students from grade 13 to grade nine. There were 20 teachers. And uh, the teachers dominantly were uh, Second World War vets, and they behaved like it. Uh, they were sure themselves, <laughs> and they took no prisoners. In fact, one of the women was a Second World War vet, Mary Malloy. Yeah. She was a yeah, she was a the uh, commerce teacher. And she'd come down with a pair of scissors that girls had long fingernails and she'd cut them shorter <laughs> so they could type better. Uh, so it was an interesting thing. It was, there, was, there was one thing in common among all the kids in that school. They were all born during the Second World War, between 39 and 45. And uh, that was the start of a whole new world. Uh, it was, hopeful as hell uh lots of jobs you could change your job every 10 minutes and still have a job the, the need for people to work and of course this burgeoning uh elementary school kids coming in and that's why they did this special program for teachers training and uh so i took instead of 15 units i took 24 units uh, uh and uh went to the summertime and so forth and got that and from there, it was just a totally different world. And there I loved it. I was there for on staff for eight years. And then I was the vice principal for four years. And then I was principal of two different uh, junior high schools, West Wally and White Rock Junior High for two, four, three years. And then the superintendent decided that I would uh, run a super school. And that is Semiamu, White Rock Junior High, and this new school called Marriott was on, coming online. And we'd have one principal over the three of them and have special vice principals at each of those schools. And each school would have a different uh, stream. You'd have uh, academic, you'd have uh, technology, and so forth. And I didn't do it. I was appointed a superintendent of schools by the provincial government and became a superintendent, spent one year in Grand Forks in Kettle Valley, and then I was assigned to West Van. 
And I spent my career, the end of my career, West Van. I, I retired somewhere in the 80s. And uh, that's my life. And from then I went out and made some money and because you don't get paid a lot of money in teaching. And uh, moved to West Van for a long time and sold out there and lots of profit of money. I mean, the <laughs> houses went up. And we moved to a new house in West in North Van. And uh, here we sit, two old parts, uh, been married for 40 years, and uh, not as long as you, but married 40 years in a house with nobody else but us. And that's the life, how we are in the middle of COVID. Well, along the pieces in that, you were also, I think, in was it 1980 and 81, you were the president of the BC school superintendents. Also, you were also playing, getting involved in the community through all that time. You played. Uh, you played soccer with uh, White Rock. Uh, was White Rock United was called? And you yeah, White Rock United. Yeah. And you yeah. Played, you played and on the played. Mads basketball team, that won the provincial championship. Oh, yes. Yeah, we won the. That was a senior A championship. That's right. Well, there was one senior A team, and all the rest were senior B, and I think we won it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's what it was—a senior B championship, but a senior A league. In it. Yeah, that was. Uh, I thought the great shot by that kid. Uh, what the hell was his name from? Uh, Vic Emmy Ron. Allen. Who? Vic, Vic Ron from Abbotsford? Yeah, Vic, Vic Ron. Yeah. The last shot he took, he took about four steps to get it clear of arms and legs and, and put it up in overtime. And it went, went in. And yeah. also, also, you were involved with the Players Club in White Rock. Yeah. I was born, uh, married to Barbara Munson uh, from uh, Abbotsford, uh, school sweetheart and she had a beautiful voice and she was a great actress and she of course immediately joined the players club and uh, became some of the and one of their important players and uh and one of the things i found as time went on that you know you had to spend more time together <laughs> and she was in theater and i was in sports and i held a lot of positions in sports organizations and uh, that that takes a lot of time so i took to writing uh the christmas pantomime and uh, nobody would direct it so i'd have to direct it too knowing nothing about direction i just the interesting thing in those days the the players club made their money on on uh, the uh, pantomime because it played 20, 30 nights, sometimes 40 nights in White Rock. And then it would go to the Kiwi Theater for two shows on, on Boxing Day. And uh, you could make enough money to keep you going because we owned our own theater. It, it was just those people who were in the theater group owned the theater. And uh, so you had a lot of bills. And so you needed a big, and that one made the big money, excuse me, the big money. And uh, it was really enjoyable because it was kind of like coaching sports, you know. <laughs> but I didn't know anything about theater, so I just all the leads, all the leads, the ones in the the big roles, uh, were professional actors and actresses. Uh, they belonged to Actra, and uh, so they had to be paid. So what we would do is we say, okay, uh, we'll pay you, but you have to put the money that you make, most of it, into the uh, players' clubs uh, plan to create, you know, uh, make the school uh, theater better and so forth. And so it was very easy to direct them because you just get them on the stage and say, okay, take your positions. I didn't know upstage, downstage, <laughs> they just <laughs> faced themselves. And so, and it was, I did that. I wrote three plays. I wrote a couple of one play, one act plays. Uh, it was just an era. And those kinds of things were a lot of fun. But what I found mostly, I mean, seven, White Rock was, it ended at 16th and 152nd. And the, other than the summertime, the busiest place in White Rock in the winter months was Five Corners. And I think maybe, maybe not many people know where Five Corners is anymore. 
but it's where the end of uh, 152nd and then Univista one way, Pacific the other, and, and so forth. The way we're semi ammo old semi ammo High School and the elementary school. And that, it was much, the, the road was paved, uh, except when it got into Surrey at 16, it changed to gravel all the way to the King George Highway because uh, White Rock had just broken away from Surrey. I don't know whether it was on purpose, but the road needed repairing. So they plowed it up, got rid of it, <laughs> and filled the holes and just left it. I don't know who the hell paid for it. You would know who paid for that. For the paving? Yeah. Well, the part in Surrey was, was Surrey paid for it, but they did get some funding provincially to assist in that. Yeah, well, that's good. Because that, that was... I think, uh, I think the first street light was actually, or the first traffic light was actually a thrift. Thrift and Johnson Road. Yes, oh, yes. Right. Oh, that was a big item. Oh, it was giant, yeah. Can you oh, tell, yeah. tell me a little bit about uh, about your kids and what they're doing now? And uh... Oh, I got four kids. Uh, the youngest uh, is a girl named Bree, and she uh, didn't like school. She's very brave, but she didn't like school much. And so she had to do something, so she said she'd take uh, hairdressing. So she takes hairdressing. And now both her parents have got you know degrees in being a university, and her her well, her grandfather was a PhD and taught at UBC, you know, kind of an academic family. Uh, and uh, she did not want to go to university. So she took hairdressing, and the school that taught the hairdressing hired her before she did anything, they hired her. She was that good. And so she graduated and she said, dad, you know what I really want to do? You know, I want for a graduation gift. And I said, I did not know there was a gift for graduating for hairdressing school. She said, well, yes, there is. So she, I said, what do you want? She said, I want to do diving. I want to do deep sea diving. Oh, God. So $30,000 later, she was a diver. and. Uh, she did that for, she was excellent. She did that for, I guess, eight years. But it wears you out, wrecks your body. So then, she, of course, she had, she always wanted to be one of these people that help people. So now she's working with autistic kids. She's worked with people with, who brain damaged young people who've had car accidents or cycle accidents. She's doing all of that kind of stuff. She lives in Kelowna. The second youngest is a guy named Ryan, and he works for a company that that makes soap. And <laughs> he was a chef. He was the Red Seal chef. He was the chef, a sous chef at the at the, the the big restaurant in West Van up on the hill. I forget the name of the huff salmon house. Yeah, and uh, he had to get out of that. It, it, that's that's an ugly business. You never ever want to stay in that business and be married. Spend all Friday night and Saturday night and so forth late in a restaurant. Uh, so he switched to what he can do really well. He's a salesman and he's really a smarmy guy. Yeah, the family says, Ryan, you're a smarm <laughs> and we can sell anything. And so he does very well, very well indeed. He bought a house in White Rock, I mean, on White Rock. Uh, I think it's 12 miles directly north of where we first lived on Buena Vista. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 108th and 152nd or something, <laughs> 150, 151. So you just think it was straight, straight down. To, so he's got a lovely house there and he's got two children and a lovely wife and he's doing well. Aaron went to university, got a degree in uh, social work. And uh, she lives in Grand Forks. She's lived in Bank. She worked at UBC. She worked at uh, Vancouver General, and and she wanted to go to the country. And uh, her brother, her older brother, Sean, has a garage in Grand Forks. And it's interesting because when we, when I became superintendent of the first job was Grand Forks, and we really didn't know where it was, and the kids. Of the, raised in White Rock and of course that beach is what a way to have a youth. 
And so I looked it up and God, it was right next to the border. It was past the Soyuz. And we went up there and it was an astounding city. It was a city, it was at one time it was quite a big city. Uh, when I say big city, it must have been 10, 12,000 people there. Uh, there were 20, 19 hotels or something in town. Uh, and then, of course, it was a mining town and it went down. But both those kids, both of them, have gone back there. They were only there for a year. So they must have liked it. Uh, they really do. And besides, they're away from COVID the whole day. And uh, basically, that's my life. My ex wife, Barb, uh, is also living in Grand Forks. She was uh, got her PhD and became a psychologist and had a practice in California. Getting her out of there was uh, quite a, a, a tell you, <laughs> getting her stuff out in her three dogs, ancient dogs, and getting her into Canada was a uh, field testing, but she's here now. So basically my brothers uh, all did well uh, and you know, it's interesting that there were so many opportunities. Bob Meek and I talked about that. And I wondered how the hell, like Bob Meek, his parents didn't go to university. Uh, in fact, the basketball team, the ones in 1960 and 61, uh, not one of their parents went to university. Uh, one had he had gone to uh, uh, nursing school. She was the closest of anything of all those kids. That was John Maher, uh, mother. And uh, you look through that group, and you got Alan Taylor, PhD, research and data analysis, an amazing guy, Bob Meek, uh, his brother. David sang opera for New York Metronome Opera at one time. And uh, Tex Parker, he, he would become an accountant. And uh, Hank Rice. Uh, yeah, Hank Bryce became big time in Shell Oil. And, and all of those people did so well. And I said to Bob, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it wasn't happening to everybody. And he's, well, it was because he said, I said, I think it's because when they were born. They just uh, like surfing. You you just took that that uh, wave all the way because it was all there for you. Yeah, well, there were lots of people born at that. There were lots of people born at that time who didn't achieve those things either. But I think that uh, the influence of each other and uh, the yeah. closeness of this community at that point in time, and uh, certainly the leadership that was shown by you and. Uh, so many in the school system that really gave them an opportunity to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I often, I can remember with the staff, I got accused in a staff meeting. Uh, I was teaching English in the grade 10, 11 English. And I uh, ran a program at noon, and it was called How to Beat an Exam. Which I shouldn't have called it that. How to, how, to, how to write a test is what we should have said. And so I had all these ways I had learned how to sit down when you have an exam and be prepared for it. And so you had all these mnemonic devices, you had all, you, know, you structure all your stuff. And when you walk in there, you put all these mnemonic devices at the top of your, your paper. And uh, if, for example, if you had 60 poems to do, you do them alphabetically. A, B squared, B, uh, C, four, you know, whatever the titles were. And from there you do it, and then the author, and then the, the, the key things of the thing, and so on. And yeah, and I was teaching this. Kids enjoyed it, and it worked. And uh, the, uh, the uh, senior English teacher, she, I think she was your teacher at the time, too. Miss Watt? Miss Watt, yeah. Yeah, yeah Miss Watt said that she understood that I was teaching kids how to, how to, how to cheat on an exam. <laughs> and I said, no, I was how to organize for an exam. Mm. And they were, they were talking about it. So I said, well, I'm, you know, and they really felt, I felt they felt 
he is somehow cheating. And this is not fair. That you know, they should bell curve. Everything is a bell curve in those days. Yeah, yeah you got five percent got A's, five percent got E's, fifteen percent got B's, fifteen percent got D's, and then the rest was the, the C's and minus and, and so forth. And it made a nice bell curve, and that's the way nature is, and that's the way the uh, Department of Education said that's how your exam should come out. So I ended out and said, I mean, I'm going to teach you grade 13 English, for God's sake. Can you imagine this kid teaching grade 13 English? And uh, I had one failure over two years. But he passed it the second year. He came back again for it. Uh, and they, the ministry actually looked into it, what was going on, the Department of Education. Because every kid wrote the same essay. And it was one of those years that Canada was going through its 100th anniversary of something or other. And I guess it was the 100th anniversary of Canada Confederation, whatever it is. And so we talked, because if you take grade 13, as you well know, no exam counted for whatever you did all year. Whatever mark you got meant nothing. You wrote a big exam at the end. And that's pretty scary unless you prepare people for it. And so I said to the kids, well, We'll enjoy English until April, and then we will work to pass the exam. Because I got a lot of kids in there that love math and physics and chem, hate English, but they have to take English. So this would be a real, it was like a sport. It was like coaching a basketball team. Yeah. So, you know, we said, well, uh, what will be the big essay? I mean, there'll be two or three choices, but there'll be one in there for sure. What is it? And so somebody said, well, Canada's second uh, 100 years. Ah, that's perfect. Okay, now we need an analogy. You've got to use that to tie the whole thing together. Somebody came up with the idea of Canada in the central because you got USSR up in the north and, you know, Mary, and so on. And we are like the hub of this, the wheel. And as a wheel turns, and that's time and, and, and lubrication, and, all, and we are the diplomats and so on. Now, this started to become a really good essay. And what they had, had checked with with the superintendent and then to Les Martin was they all wrote the same essay, but it wasn't the same, but it was the same analogy. And I said, well, yeah, we just kind of practice what we thought we'd get for exam. And the, to me, that's the part of school that was so much fun, was getting people on a theme, which is going to help them all, which would be fun. Yeah. Like the, uh, I think it only lasted one year, the great uh, Cabbage Island uh, sale. Uh, Rafts, people built rafts on the yeah, go to yeah. sail them all the way to Cabbage Island. Yeah. Nobody got on the harbor. <laughs> <laughs> the world, the the world went the other way. Yeah. Uh, so you can talk a little bit about uh, your wife today, mentioning Barb. You didn't talk about your wife, Barb, today. Well, I somebody said, Carlin, you're just a bad boy because you don't want to make a mistake in the middle of the night making love so you marry two barbs <laughs> so, well, that's true but she's a remarkable woman she was a teacher in west van when i went there i my job they told me my first job the secretary my head secretary said was to wish all the new teachers, uh, congratulate them on getting a job in West Van, how bloody lucky they are. <laughs> I didn't know whether they were lucky or not, but they thought they were lucky, the, the staff did. So I went down and there were about 40 teachers, 50 teachers, and there was a stunningly beautiful looking woman in the middle. And I thought she'd stand up and she'd have 
hips about you know four feet wide there's something wrong with us nobody that beautiful is going into teaching i thought and she did and we wooed and then we married and that was 40 years ago this june we've been together for 42 years and uh what i love about her is she's so ridiculously independent and bright and 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 dependent at the same time we like the same things and she's been a lot of fun i've actually had a remarkable life i just Sure. I've been all my life. Um, part of it is making the right decision, but you don't even know you made the right decision when you made the decision. Yeah. And things roll. And, uh, I, you know, what getting ready for this thing, I thought, well, maybe I'll look to see if there's something I've got. And there it is. Wow, the torch. <laughs> <laughs> 1957 58. Yeah. And it was hoser. I mean, the only flat spot in White Rock was that gym floor. Yep. And of course, everybody had to wear running shoes. Yep. And I've got part of it right here still. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the floor, yeah. 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 I gave out a number of pieces of it. So you, well, you really have uh, had a remarkable life and uh, those of us who've been a part of that feel very blessed as well. So I, I just found White Rock was, there was a couple of strange things that when I got there. I had never been in a town where everybody had an Anglo-Saxon name. Yeah. They were English or Scottish or, I mean, uh, Welsh, Irish. There was the, the foreign name in the schools I recall was, uh, Bill's last name, your brother-in-law. DeWince. DeWince. Yeah. It was spelled funny. DeWince. And yeah. And but there was there was one Japanese kid in the school. Uh, there were no Chinese. Not one. And it it was I went to school in mission after the war ended. When I was in high school, of course, all the people started coming coming from Europe displaced persons called DPs, an awful name. And you couldn't pronounce their names let alone spell them. And then I went to Abbotsford and Abbotsford was a Mennonite primarily. And they usually spoke German around you if there were three or four of them. And, and uh, they're probably talking about you too in German. And then I went there, it was just, the problem with that of course is that People from those countries are so short. And I like basketball. We never had a chance <laughs> until finally we got two big guys, Tex Parker and, and Carl Anderson. And uh, when I looked at the, at the annual here, God, here's Carl Anderson ahead over everybody else. And uh, he did not want to play basketball, he said. And then he finally said, well, he'd play if he didn't have to dribble the ball. <laughs> and he ended up with first string all star in the BC playoffs. But uh, ironically, he said to me when we had a reunion two years ago, and I said, God, if I could just get you to dribble a basketball, he says, I sure wish you had. <laughs> what? <laughs> because you threatened to quit. Yeah. So you don't know uh, when you're dealing with kids and you make so many mistakes. But hopefully you make more uh, encouraging ones than you do mistakes. Yeah. Because sometimes you tell a kid, uh, you know, give them good advice. And uh, you think it's good advice. And it turns out it's really bad advice. Something. Well, you know, it's interesting going in, into teaching and having gone to school. Uh, I... It was, it was like if I were watching a doctor operating, uh, taking an appendix out for 12 years and I was in there watching that, I probably could take an appendix out. Mm -hmm. And if you watch people teach and you pick stuff that you think works and doesn't work for you, 
and then you really don't need a, a lot of training for it because you've already had 12 years of it. Yeah. And you know what kids like it. But it also has to take into account that every teacher's different, every, God, I had some awful teachers, uh, some marvelous teachers, uh, being a principal and then a superintendent, uh, I dealt with a lot of teachers and basically they're all wonderful except some people shouldn't go into teaching as some doctors should go into doctoring or at anything you know you know it well and, and uh when i just coming back to white rock by the sea i stayed my first year there at the white rock lodge and that i stayed with a, a new guy in the staff he was from england and he, in England, uh, White Rock, first of all, he's going to teach a semi amu He was trying to get away from a girlfriend. He was leaving England. He had to go somewhere. So he took this job in a school called semi amu which he hardly pronounced, but he knew it was native, in, native Indian. And, and he was going to stay at the White Rock Lodge. Well, in England, a lodge <laughs> is a teepee, <laughs> kind of. And... Uh, they were English or rabbit and the Suggas, and they were a grand couple. And I, the White Rock Lodge, I guess, went for a long time. It was a, a, a great place to grow up, I'm sure. My kids, I'm telling you, in the summertime, who was the guy who owned the White Rock, uh, the White Rock Sun? Uh, Master Rosowski. Master Rosowski. When I was principal of White Rock Junior High, it was summertime. And he called me and uh, he wanted to see me at the White Rock office. And that gravelly voice he had, he said, Carlin, damn you. He said, <laughs> I've got the best picture. I, all my years in the, in the picture business, this picture says everything. And you're in it, and I can't <laughs> use it. <laughs> but even though I shouldn't use it, I feel I should use it. And it was a picture of me. And for some reason, a new RCMP officer, White Rock, thought he would walk down the beach in the middle of the summer, hot day, and uh, in his uniform, and arrest people or give them tickets who were drinking on the beach, which was most everybody. And the picture was of me, and I wish you'd have given me a copy of it. And the picture was from behind. It was a White Rock Sun photographer, and he took it from behind me, and I got my hands out like this, and there's a cop here uh, talking to me, and there's a bottle of beer stuck in the back of my, my <laughs> short <laughs> swimsuit, and my hands like that, and it said it all. And he just, oh, so wanted to. But we made it up because then on the final day, the strap was legal. I strapped 180 some kids. And uh, that certainly got in the paper. And, uh, but it made it raise quite a bit of money. It was a kid's idea. Last chance, can you imagine getting the strap? I mean, it hurt. Did you ever get the strap? I was there for that closing one and I got the strap as you were doing that at White Rock Chair. <laughs> yeah. But, but I never never got it before that. It hurts. Yeah. It really hurt. But that was, uh, you know, they couldn't figure out how you could run a school without the strap. When BC made it illegal, it was assault after that. Mm -hmm. After that Friday day was over, the next Monday it was, it was assault. Mm -hmm. So the kids said, well, you know, we're trying to ra raise money for the school that we're building in Africa. And what a neat way to make the money. Because we can have a strap of thought, Mr. Carter. We can have a strap of thought. No, we can't. The ministry, the minister of education should kill me. And uh, they talked me into it. It cost 25 cents to get one SWAT. And you put your money in there, and then the strap was put on a board for the for the industrial education. So this is the the uh, official torture device or something way wrong junior high so um so if you're you sir uh 
as, as you're right, we're, we're uh, going to get cut off pretty soon. But is there any kind of message you'd like to leave for, for the people who are going to be watching this uh, now and 20 years from now? Well, I'll tell you, uh, those old days, as you get older, you get nostalgic about days. And, and there were some crummy things about it. Uh, not many. Uh, well, as time passes. But it was as we all say, simpler. We didn't have crazy people going on like we have now uh, in this wonderful Trump days. I just, I, I think that in schools uh, is one thing, you know. Finally, schools have got past the idea that academia is everything. They give awards and money to kids who do really well uh, and sports too they do the same thing you get all this but it's all that other stuff yeah so thanks again you had a had a profound impact on so many lives in our community and talked about how wonderful the community is and certainly it is and and was a wonderful community and a lot of that goes to to you to say thank you for helping this community have the culture and the feeling and the caring that it has thanks well, so very thank much you. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful people. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, Keep connecting. Thank you.